Welcome to this week's episode of the Liberty Unveiled Podcast, formerly the Teshua Unveiled Podcast. I am your host, Brad Hopp, and I'm joined by my friend and co-host, Pastor Sam Jones. Together, we are unveiling liberty one episode at a time. We'll be discussing the latest in trafficking news, insider stories from those being delivered, and studying the Founders Bible to learn how to return America to sanity and true freedom. Our sponsor for today's show is Teshua Tea Company. Visit TeshuaTea.com or DeliveranceTea.com. Hi guys, welcome to the Liberty Unveiled Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Hopp, and this is my friend, Pastor Sam Jones. And as you can tell, we're we're still in his office set up today. And, and uh, so we decided to record a couple episodes today to kind of work ourselves ahead a little bit here. But um, in the earlier episode, we were really kind of focusing in on on um, fatherhood and, and the absence of fathers in, in America and, and how that has really played into the decline of the American family and stuff and, and America in general because really as the family goes so goes the nation absolutely and I think that that's something that a lot of times people don't realize is how much um, fathers and I'm and I'm not disparaging mothers but there there is an order to things and when that order is followed things work um, you know, I have my, mm-hmm. my fire truck out here, for example. You know, if Let's I get in Guam, into, huh? Let's head to Guam. I can't Let's believe you're driving that all the way to Guam. Uh, That's yeah. incredible. <laughs> <laughs> I offered to take it there for them. Actually, they had two other ones. They had, um, so for those of you that don't know, I part time have gone back to delivering fire trucks part time, brand new million dollar fire trucks and half a million dollar ones. And this is probably half a million dollars actually. And, uh, but anyway, I've gone back to doing that part time, and uh, and so anyway, um, I've flew down to uh, South Carolina the other day and picked one up, and took it up to Nescohoning, Pennsylvania, and dropped it off, and then picked up this one, and am on my way home with it for the weekend, and then I'll take off Monday and, and run it down to. Uh, uh, the east side of the LA basin and stuff and then they'll put it on a ship and and this one's actually for the uh, US Navy their naval base in Guam so it's getting put on a ship over there but um, they had two tillers which the tillers are the great big huge uh, fire trucks that that they have the guy in the back steering the back end of it oh wow so it's like a tractor trailer so it, it articulates in the middle and uh, so it's you can separate it it's they never do unless they have to do repairs on them but Mm -hmm. um but otherwise they never uh, really take the truck apart into the two halves but um they had two of those that were really pretty yellow and white ones that were going to go to honolulu or hawaii and i'm like oh i'll take them over there for you (laughs) (laughs) i'll hand deliver them for you they didn't let me do that but just make them amphibious so i can just go all the way (laughs) You go. So anyway, so welcome to the Liberty Unveiled podcast. So um, to kind of give you a little bit of background about Liberty Unveiled and Teshua Tea Company and, and what we're doing, my business partner, Andrew, is a missionary in Communist Asia. And a lot of you heard the stories. I talk about it every time. But um, he and the team rescue girls out of trafficking. We get the girls into our rescue and rehab facility. We teach them to make bracelets and coasters and how to harvest and process tea and coffee and run a tea shop. and and do all these different things and then we buy the products from the girls and that's the key thing that I really want people to get a hold of is we're buying the products from the girls so that they have economic empowerment and then we're bringing those products stateside and selling it over here with half our profits 100% of the donations going back to the rescue facility so so, so just want to make sure everyone understands this because this uh, this is the thing it, it took me a couple episodes to really kind of wrap my head around it because nobody does it this way right um, they either do it one of, one of two ways. One, they either just buy it straight from the the source, right? right. And, and saying, "Well, look, this is how it's the ministry. It's bought from or from them, so it's empowering them financially." You're doing that, mm-hmm. and then you're going, "Oh, and when we sell stuff, we make a profit, fifty percent of that, n- not not fifteen, fifty right. five zero, right? Goes back to the girls. Oh, and by the way, in case you guys just want to get involved, you can donate in a hundred percent." Go straight right. to the mission. Right. So if you're thinking about all that, this is 
something that is incredibly ministry based. Because one thing, whenever you start selling stuff and you start attaching to ministry or you start attaching a good cause to it, things like that, people always come up with this. This, and I understand why, but they always come up with this this crazy thing of, well, you just did it for the money. Uh, for the money to go back to the girls. Right. Well, and if that was the case, you know, if it really... And you, <laughs> then you're not a very good businessman if that was the case, if you're in it for the money, for how you have it set up, because you have it set up to where it's going to, I mean, where the money's going to the girls. Right. Well, and yeah. I, I snapped you a picture um, about a month ago, maybe three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we are at a tea shop, mm -hmm. and it was a tea cake. It was a white tea cake. And, and I just said, and it was double or triple the price of yours for same mm -hmm. size. Mm -hmm. And and I go, maybe I ought to bump that price. price up a little bit. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing, you know. Um, just wait till after I buy it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, that's the thing that I want people to understand, too, is if I was really in this for the money, you know, I wouldn't be putting my own money in it to... If I was just in it for the money, and, and if that was all it was about, I mean, mm -hmm. obviously I have to provide for my family. Am I at that point yet? No, but we'll get there, and, and God's going to provide and, and stuff, and, and things are coming into play, and things are starting to be positioned. You know, we have Judd over on our side of the state now, and and uh, we finally got him woke enough to come over to our side. Yeah. <laughs> should, should, should we... Uh... Give a shout out to equipping the persecuted. Yes, we should. So, um, so for you, those, those of you that haven't seen that episode, we had my friend Judd Saul on. He is, he's kind of like me. He does kind of a lot of different things. He's a movie producer. He uh, is part time missionary, and he's also actually a, uh, a life insurance yeah. agent. Yeah. And um, so, Judd has moved over to our side of the state, and. Um, Good riddance. We're glad to get rid of it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Judd's a great friend. Uh, but anyway, so Judd has moved over to our side of the state, and, and he has a ministry called Equipping the Persecuted, and they do work in Nigeria and stuff. And mm -hmm. and um, if you have not watched the news and you have not been paying attention to what's going on in, in Nigeria right now, which is not surprising because it does not, I hardly ever hear anything about Nigeria other than what I hear through Judd. Mm -hmm. um, but I have seen the pictures of what what well, Judd's people are going it, through, and it's awful. It's not very advantageous for the narratives that are going out. And, of course, everything right now is about coronavirus anyway. But um, in Nigeria, there's true persecution on mm -hmm. Christians from Muslims. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things of you could sit out there and say, Islam's a peaceful religion until so you're blue in the face. And the problem is, is that they've left a carnage of, of bodies Mm -hmm. uh, across Nigeria and in other places in Africa right now. Uh, and these Christians are absolutely just being uh, persecuted. We're not talking about being made fun of for uh, praying at lunchtime. We're talking about having their heads chopped off, being mm -hmm. shot at, and being chased around with machetes and um, right. being kidnapped and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and so the work that Judd is doing is very important. And so actually Teshua and Equipping the Persecuted are, are starting to work together and stuff. and, and uh, um, so Judd is going to be helping me put out some more, um, you know, advertising and some more videos and, and different things like that. But the goal is, and always will be with Teshua, is to really focus in on being able to get the profits back to, you know, as much as we can. I mean, obviously there's expenses to the business and, and, and you know, you have lights to pay for. You have, you know, utilities and... and coffee roasters and and whatever mm -hmm. else and stuff and overhead um but we're we're always our goal has always been and always will be to work to get as much of the of much of the profit uh as we can back to the groups that really need it and and really um that we're trying to help and stuff and so that's where where this all kind of ties together and stuff is that judd and i are going to be working together we're trying to see if there's a possibility of uh, products that we can bring in from his people, um, or if there, because of infrastructure, which is really uh, backwards and limited in Nigeria right now, actually. Um, and actually, you were talking about coronavirus, and actually, uh, Boko Haram is really using coronavirus to their advantage right now. Really? Because the government is 
oh, COVID, oh, COVID. And, and so the government is really doing nothing to stop or hinder Boko Haram from slaughtering mm -hmm. Christians there right now. And, and so Judd and his team actually went and they bought some, some uh, two-way radios and, and uh, high-powered two-way radios. And, and so the, the, the villages or the communities are able to talk back and forth and, and if one of them's getting attacked and, and they're able to radio and, and request help and stuff. So, you know, the, the goal is to be able to um, put together um, not only um, equipment like that, but to be able to get food and medical supplies and things like that in there. But there's actually some things that have uh, are coming about um, kind of off the radar, so to speak, yet. Um, we actually just uh, hooked up with some friends of ours, um, Michelle and Shay Watson, which I don't know if you've ever heard of them. They're on the Christian Podcasters Association and okay. and um, were a part of that Facebook group and stuff. And and uh, Shay was actually a uh, uh, former military uh, special force to special operations and stuff. And so um, we're actually, and he, he, and he still lives, he and his wife still live in um, in the D.C. area. And so we're actually trying to uh, he's a praise and worship leader now and stuff, but we're actually mm -hmm. working to um, connect some dots there. Connect some dots person. there, especially since he's got connections with security forces and stuff, and well, and um, be able to go in and defend the the weak and the powerless and the, and the widow and the orphan. Well, well, this kind of plays a little bit into what we talked about last time too about mercy and things like that. Um, in, in both of these ministries, mm -hmm. both Teshua and Equipping the Persecuted are gospel centered. That's mm -hmm. the that's the incredible thing. But a testimony from uh, equipping the persecuted, and I'm not gonna have the exact details, I'm not the equipping the persecuted guy. Right. Uh, but just from talking to Judd here, and this happened a few months back, um, Boko Haram came down, attacked a Christian village. They also left a, a Muslim village just destroyed too, because you know, they're they're gonna go and destroy whatever they want to destroy, mm -hmm. basically. Uh, and the Muslims, there's different sects of the Muslims too, so the different sects will fight each other. And, right. And so I think that might have played in part of it too. Right. And and so, of course, first of all, they, they go and they um, send aid out to the Christian community, uh, get get aid out there, uh, get food and things like that. Mm -hmm. That's a big thing, especially with the eternal, uh, the, the IDP camps, uh, internal displacement camps, uh, displaced persons camps. And, um, and then they also... Uh, the church building had been destroyed, and so they went out and they got the supplies to rebuild the church building, which the pastor, first of all, there was just, you know, uh, weeping, basically. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, wow, you know, we've seen other people go and bring in food before. We've seen them go and do this before. We've seen them go do that before. But nobody's ever helped us with the church before when we mm -hmm. had it destroyed. That wasn't normal. But, uh, of course, there's a high emphasis uh, in equipping the persecuted on the fact that, that, that churches are important. Mm -hmm. Um, but then they, they decided, you know what, this, this Muslim camp was also attacked. Uh, let's go and let's take them some food relief too. And of course they did it carefully, they did it wisely. Mm -hmm. And they went in there and, and they did that and the Muslims accepted it and they allowed them to preach the gospel to mm -hmm. them. And, and Judd couldn't give me the exact numbers, uh, but he said, we had to order about twice the amount of Bibles is what we normally have to because wow. so many people are getting saved. Well, and you know, this brings up a point and it's something that, that I want to really stress with with this and, and really kind of let you in on on my mindset of why why did we structure Teshua the way we did? Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I think a lot of times people don't understand um, it's easy to donate it's easy to send money in. It's in, easy to send supplies in. It's easy to flood an area with with shirts. And, and you know, we always do these. We always see the Christian community. Yeah, the, the, the loser of the Super Bowl uh, shirts. Yeah. We, yeah. we always go out and we buy these, you know, these massive shirts and stuff or clothes and whatever. And we send them in. But what we don't understand and we fail to comprehend a lot of times is... It's the law of unintended consequences. I, I, this is one of my favorite laws, mm -hmm. and it's probably the, one, of, one of the laws that's most commonly broken because we don't stop and look any further than into this. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we, oftentimes we see, oh, you know, this people group was hurt, and, and so we rush in and we, we, we um, 
and, I, and I'm not, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not, uh, Judd is doing what is necessary. But, but but this isn't where Judd wants to stop. He's got plans to do other things too, which I think is right where you're going. Yeah, because the the goal is not to create a a baby that has to suck on the mother's breast all the time. That's that dependency. The goal is to create an independent, standing on their own people group. You're. It's the old principle, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. I, and That's not how I heard that. I thought it was, if you, if you give a man a fish, he eats for a day. If you teach a man to fish, he buys a boat and gets in a bunch of debt. And, and well, that's Sean any... Conrad. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One of my buddies uh, that fishes a lot and was, <laughs> he's always buying, a, yeah, he's always buying. <laughs> Just... Just kidding. No, no, no. It, it is. You get, give somebody a fish, they eat for a day. You teach them a fish, they can eat for a lifetime. But, yeah, it does cost. <laughs> yeah. But the goal is, and, and this is the reason we structured Tishua the way we did, and, and the reason Judd, Judd is working with Nigeria and the, and the stuff the way that we're working there, bar, the working, we're working there, is because... He's on the East Coast. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, that's... <laughs> That, that's his, his Bostonian accent. Yeah, Even though he wasn't in Boston. The drawers. Um, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go build some drawers. Um, anyway, <laughs> sorry. Is I it a creek or a crick? Oh, um, it is a crick. <laughs> <laughs> I am from Western Iowa, and it is a crick. It is not a creek. It is a crick. Uh, yes. Jess has a crick in my neck. And <laughs> <laughs> um. But anyway, so in, in doing this, the thing that people don't understand, and this is where a lot of missions organizations, I think they really, um, they drop the ball. Because a lot of times mm -hmm. we will rush in with all these supplies, food, and or not food, but, but you know, it's important to take care of the food and the, clo and the, the, the food and the medical and get that stuff in there. But when we rush in with... Um, uh, clothing and building supplies from outside to westernize a lot of times from outside of the area and instead of buying it in country what happens mm -hmm. is you actually end up destroying the economy of the area that you're going into and the law of unintended consequences causes these business owners that okay so if I go into a village and there's a thousand people there and I need to get a little more technical here for a second, but I, I need to draw this out so people understand. If I go into a village and there's a thousand people there and I bring in 5,000 shirts and 5,000 pairs of pants and 5,000 pairs of shoes, but I bring them in from outside so that it's not bringing dollars into that local mm -hmm. economy, what I am going to do is, there's already stores there. These people aren't living in, in huts with no stores, and there's stores in the area. There's, there's food supplies in the area. But if I'm bringing them in from outside and I'm not supporting the local economy, what I actually end up doing is destroying the local economy, and whoever owned the, the clothing store or the whatever, I now put them out of business. Right. And, and so I read this article years ago, or several years back, and it really brought this point home to me because what they were talking about was they, t they said, you know, when we do this, we actually end up creating the warlords because now we have guys that are, that are trying to survive and they end up fighting for control to be able to get to the sources, or the, the supplies that they need. And we end up creating these warlords and we actually end up causing a bigger problem than if we would do it correctly. Mm-hmm. And instead of bringing in the, the 5,000 pairs of shirts and pants and shoes from outside, actually buy that locally. Mm -hmm. We could support the local economy, which puts dollars into that local economy, which starts those dollars swirling through. Because that guy's going to go out and he's going to buy other supplies from other people. And it's going to put the money into the local right. economy. And, and so our goal with Teshua and stuff is to create the local economy... Mm -hmm. And and I've I've said this same principle applies in Iowa for years. We had, you know, if you go back a hundred years from from today, 
and you went back and you started looking at our in our local economies, I asked my dad one day because my dad would have been uh, my dad would have been ninety this year. Yeah, my dad would have been ninety this year. So I have a unique perspective on this because of my dad's age. And, mm -hmm. and this isn't really where I was planning on going, but I think it's important for people to understand this. Um, because my dad was would have been 90 this year, I asked him one time, we were sitting around before he passed away, this is, he died in 2003, so this is probably 2000 or whatever, that we were sitting around one day and I asked him, I said, what was Mobile, the town of 1,500 people that I'm from, what was it like when you were a kid? And he said, well, we had a, um, a butcher, a locker, um, a uh, hatchery, we had a stockyards, uh, we had two or three grocery stores, two or three banks, two or three hardware stores, two or three lumber yards, um, several saloons, you know, several churches. Um, we had uh, a railroad depot. Um, we had a, a John Deere, uh, Massey Harrison, a farm mall dealership. We had a Ford, a Chevy, and a Chrysler dealership in a town of 1,500 people. Wow, that's incredible. And, and so I'm sitting here and, and I added it up and I think when we when we finally got all said and done, there was a roller skating rink, there was a movie theater, there was a five and dime, um, there was obviously the lawyers and, and, and that stuff. Um, you know, I went through and I think we had like 45 businesses on Main Street in Mobile at one point. How, how many are there today? There's not a grocery store. We have Dollar General. Um, well, I mean, we we were just talking because uh, two gas stations. We're, we're driving through Hudson, where where I was, where where I am, and where we were recording from today. There's no, there's no. Sorry, there is a grocery store. There's no restaurant in Hudson right, right now. Um, there, I mean, there there's some businesses here, and Hudson's twice as big as Mobile. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's just we've abandoned. Mm -hmm. our local economies. But if you stop and think about it, <clears throat> and this is where it, where this is where this principle really hit home for me was I started thinking and I'm like, okay, what was it that made the difference? In a hundred years, the population is the same. Okay, I understand the cars came in, I get that. But what, was that really the catalyst? Was that really the thing that, that brought it to the point where it is where we have, you know, I mean, we don't have a grocery store anymore. We have uh, Dollar General. We have a pharmacy. We have a funeral home. Um, we have two banks. Um, we have a subway. We have a, a, a the restaurant closed, but I think they're working on reopening one. Uh, we have a, um, a uh, coffee house but they're only open part-time. And then we have two gas stations and one mall there and one mechanic. And I mean, we don't have a lot of businesses, but I started thinking about it and, and this is where I say that local economy is so vitally important because if you go back a hundred years from today, we had approximately four farmers per square mile. Mm -hmm. Today, we probably have one farmer per four square miles right. or more. And so we have, we have taken where we would have had in that four square miles that one guy controls now, we would have had 16 farmers. That's 16 people going to town to buy hardware. That's 16 guys going to town to buy chickens. That's 16 guys going to town to buy um, lumber or, uh, you know, taking cows to the butcher or to the locker or, you know, in, in, or to the stockyards or to whatever. And if you think about it, we, if we have something local, like a restaurant or, or, you know, I'm, I'm going to drive three miles rather than 10 miles. If I don't have to drive 10 miles, I'm not going to. And I, and I drive for a living, but if I don't have to, I'm going to, I'm going to Stay in my local area and but when we remove that when we remove the dollars from the local economy 
it destroys the local economy and you end up with you know a quarter of the supplies that you had there before and right. and that's the thing you know we took so many farmers out of the equation and the big guys started buying in bulk from from the big cities and stuff or from you know maybe their local co-op but then the co-op started combining and and so on and so forth so every town didn't have their own local co-op and and stuff but so you really saw the dollars leave that local economy and go to a more of a state or a county-wide area and that's what we don't want to see happen in Nigeria where or in countries where we can go into missions and, and work there is we want to keep as many of the dollars locally as we can because if you don't that's where I come back to you you create a lot of warlords and you create a lot of because now you create a, a vacuum of power because you have a lot of businesses that have gone under and stuff and so now you create this vacuum and well, one it's it's really interesting because where this concept comes from as to how this is created is that it comes from a lack of history understanding of mm -hmm. history because what they're trying to do uh, out of our generosity here in the West and in Europe and America we, we've been very blessed mm -hmm. in, in the last few hundred years and uh, a lot of that's because of our Christian heritage mm -hmm. and, and founding but we we see the blessings and so we go we want to share that and so there's a, an outpour of generosity mm -hmm. there really is people going and complain about capitalism, call it crony capitalism, call it greedy capitalism, all this kind of stuff. The reality of it is is that uh, you won't find more generosity anywhere right. outside of capitalism. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's very, very, very generous. Uh, that doesn't mean that everybody's generous in capitalism. Right. I get that. Um, but we go and we try to westernize these places mm -hmm. because we've had the success. We want to share in the success with them. It's, it's well intended. And so we just go and we're like, okay, we're going to go buy it for you. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that it's a lack of history of understanding how we got to that point, mm -hmm. how we got that uh, to that point in civilization, which was um, really based upon, uh, it was based upon the Ten Commandments and following the Ten Commandments mm -hmm. and those principles uh, found within the Ten Commandments and, and in God's law. Mm -hmm. And so instead of going and bringing the principles to the people, Mm -hmm. We go and try to make a shortcut and buy it for them and buy the, the successes, and that just doesn't work. It cu well, it cuts, off, it cuts off their ability to work and to produce and to... And, and this is the thing that I love about what Andrew is doing, and this is the reason that he and I partnered up, is because... in. You know, I, I don't think that when we first started looking at this, I don't think that this concept had been drawn out. It has been since then. But when we first started partnering up, he was just looking at selling the braces here or there. Would anybody like to buy one? You know, it wasn't really a concentrated effort. But, you know, when you, when you, um, when you teach somebody how to, to work and how to produce... It, it creates a self-worth in them, it creates a value in them, it creates a work ethic in them, and it creates um, a, a vibrancy in that local economy as, as more and more people learn to begin to, or begin to learn how to work and how to put their hands to the plow and, and do these different things. It creates a vibrancy in that local economy that, that you know, is difficult to take away. Mm -hmm. And well, and it's <clears throat> it, it, there's a saying that I heard recently that I think really fits this. Mm -hmm. Most people want the results, but they don't want the process. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the uh, that's the thing that what Teshua is doing is it's bringing the process that made America great, mm -hmm. that made any nation great because it's righteousness exalts a nation, but sin has reproached any people. It made these things great, and it's it's putting this and infusing this into um, girls who are rescued as sex slavery, mm -hmm. and, and that's the incredible thing. Because some people might go, well, what, well, you know, that's just a drop in the bucket. Well, it starts somewhere. It has to start somewhere. And, oh. and why not start with the people who are most downtrodden? Mm -hmm. and, and that's you know that's the incredible thing because you're you're literally pulling them out of the depths of hell, um, in hell on earth, and then also spiritual hell too. Mm -hmm. That they're they're on their way to hell. 
and they hear the gospel, and, and many of them have accepted Christ their Savior. It's not, it's, it's not mandated because you can't force somebody to accept the gospel, but mm -hmm. they're forced to hear it. <laughs> they're forced right. to listen to it. And that's all you can ask for, and almost everybody does accept the gospel uh, in this, this ministry that, that we've seen. Um, it, it's a very high conversion rate, which is mm -hmm. incredible. So, okay, so let's, let's just draw some numbers out here. Because I think it's important for people to understand the concept of multiplication. And this is something that we miss really often. So, <clears throat> so far, Andrew and the team have rescued 63 girls. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say that those 63 wow. girls go out, and I'm going to cut it down in half. So, let me go back to my numbers here. So, <clears throat> let's, call it, um, let's call it 31. So, let's say 30, or let's say we have each of those... Each of the 63 girls uh, partners up with another young lady and they go out and they start their own rescue mission. Which, by the way, isn't crazy to think about because actually the mission that's going on right now in the mission house, the two girls that are there running it, were at the start of this mission work. Right. They were the ones that, that, that came into the, into the restaurant and, and they were the ones that really had a heart to, to go into the brothels and, and stuff. And, and so now those two young ladies that, that started out in the restaurant, you know, working with Andrew are now actually overseeing the rescue facility. And so let's say that, that you know, these, the girls that are in the rescue facility break up into, into pairs of two and they go out and they start, start rescue facilities and they rescue 63, people, 63 girls. So now in, so let's say five years from now, those initial 63, irregardless or regardless rather of, of any of others that are ever rescued, let's just start with those 63. So we have 31 rescue houses started. Mm -hmm. And let's say they go out and rescue 63 people or 63 girls themselves. That's almost, that's 1,953 girls that could be rescued in, in five years just from the girls that are in the rescue facility right now. Mm -hmm. and, and let's take that and divide it by to again um, uh, is 976. If you have the 976 rescue missions and we take that and we um, multiply it by 63, in 10 years you could have 61,519 people rescued out of sex trafficking. Wow. I mean, and that, that's in a five year period mm -hmm. or in, you know, in five years of working learning to to you know recovering learning to put your hand to the plow now you're 18 19 years old you've seen what we do you've seen how we do it you've been discipled now go out and replicate it and in mm -hmm. in and i mean and, and these girls are going to have a heart for that too because this is what they're coming out of i mean literally being rescued in the night being pulled out of brothels mm -hmm. um and I took that another. I took that another five years. It's one million nine hundred and thirty-seven thousand. Wow! Can you imagine? In, 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 that is the power of multiplication. And in, 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 am I saying that all the girls are going to go into rescuing? No, but the, that's the power of, of multiplication. Right. It, 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 it literally in 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 that's each one of them partnering up with a, with a friend and going out and rescuing just sixty-three girls. Mm-hmm. Uh, imagine the dent that that could make in the in the trafficking world considering that four million people a year are trafficked and of those four million one million of them are kids <laughs> wow uh, you you just eliminated you just rescued in 15 years you just rescued half half of the world's population of, of trafficking victims and, and all the kids yeah well that i mean Wow. And, and, and am I saying that's going to happen? No, but, but, but it could, but it could. And that's the power of multiplication. And that's right. where, but you have to have that solid foundation. You have to have that, that work ethic. You have to have that ability of saying, okay, what can I do to economically empower somebody? And how can I help them be economically empowered and so that they're not relying on the nanny state or the big government or, or handouts from overseas or whatever. How can I economically empower somebody? And, 
And there's a book, um, I think it's called his website, uh, deliverancetea.com, that you can buy yeah. tea from, and that's how you can help them out. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, but the book I was going to mention is, is a book called um, A Boy and His Hen, if I remember right. Um, the boy in the book is named Coco. Uh, it, it's based on a true story in Africa. This young boy, uh, dad either died or, or split or something, but mom... Mom was raising him as a single parent, um, and he wanted to go to school. So he saved up his, his literally pennies, and he saved up enough to buy one hen. And then he would take, and he would gather all the eggs, and he would take those eggs on Saturday, and he would sell them at the farmer's market. And then every week, he would save up that money, and he kept, he would save up that money, and then he would buy another hen, and then he bought another hen. And... And then um, he saved up enough that he was able to buy school clothes and, and, and the supplies and, and pay for his tuition and stuff. And then he kept buying, you know, saving up and saving up and saving up and buying a couple more hens and, and one or more hens. And, mm -hmm. and, he, and he kept going and he finally got to a point where he was, he was, you know, beginning to have a successful little tiny business. And then he was able to take and... Um, he actually was able to finally get a micro loan and bought, you know, a hundred chickens or whatever it was. And then he eventually kept building and kept building and kept building and kept building. Now he had his education and he still had his little chicken to farm. And now he was able to start employing neighbors and he was able to start employing family members. And he was starting able to, you know, able to start employing friends and, wow. and, and it just kept building. And I think he was in Kenya, I think. But it got to the point where he was one of the biggest chicken producers in the nation. And it all started with one hen. Mm -hmm. And it all started with one young man learning the principles of capitalism and just going out and putting one foot in front of the other and just keeping going and keeping going and keeping going and just kept building and kept building and kept building. Well, one, you want to know where the principles of capitalism are found? Book of Proverbs, mm -hmm. the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, so speaking of that, I guess, should we jump in? Yeah, we should jump in here. Uh, so we can go through it. You want to tell them about the Founder's Bible a little bit? Well, the Founder's Bible was written by David Barton and several other incredible historians, um, guys that have a lot of source documentation. Yeah. I would I would absolutely love to go through David's collection just to see it. I mean, oh yeah. I, mean, I wouldn't well, could, be able could, to read it all, but... <laughs> Yeah, it's just, just just to look at it. I mean, I, I collect some old books. I'll have to show you a couple of my old books mm -hmm. before you leave. Uh, I've got a Bible from the 1800s. It's uh, mm -hmm. got a uh, carved um, uh, cover on oh, it. Okay. It's, it's pretty cool. Uh, but I mean, my collection, it's not even, it's nothing compared to David Barton's. It's the idea of like, it's not even nothing to nothing. I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, uh, yeah. yeah, his are just incredible. Uh, and, and so much... I mean, you know, I say from the 1800s, his stuff is from the 1700s. Mm -hmm. Or even mm -hmm. earlier, I think, right. some of his stuff. Yeah, yeah. it's incredible. Uh, but we, so we just read um, from Exodus 13 uh, notes, and we're, and we're not going through the scripture per se. Right. Uh, we're going through the notes on this, the historical notes in this Bible. And uh, we went through Exodus 13 and, and compared that to God's deliverance. Uh, of Israel out of Egypt and remembering the Passover uh, mm -hmm. yearly to us remembering um, God's deliverance uh, on our nation mm -hmm. out of the hands of tyrants uh, on the 4th of July. And of course, right. uh, it's, it's not a biblical mandate to do that, but it, but it is a, a nice comparison. Mm -hmm. And Elias Boudinot uh, made that comparison and we forgot to look up. Yeah. And that's okay though, we'll, we'll do that. Um, you know, but this is, I think that this is really important because Talking about that, you know, um, the farm that my mom and dad were married on, uh, or when they lived on them when they were first married and stuff, the house was extremely old. Um, and uh, in fact, it was so old that it was literally built with stacked two by fours. It wasn't that they put the two by fours in an upright position like we would for stud walls. They actually took them and laid them like this and stacked them, literally one on top of the other. Really? Yeah. The the walls in that in that house were so old that it was it was almost like a log cabin, but it was built out of two by full dimension two by fours, literally stacked on top of each other. Well, literally like Legos. Be pretty easy to hang something on the wall. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I, but I think the original house was just a, it was only like a 15 by 15 room probably, but it was, it was, um, it was all stacked two by fours. And then I think, I think there was an addition put on later, but my dad had burned down the house before he passed away. He, he had, you know, it was, it was old and decrepit and, and whatnot. And, and so he had torn it down or bull, um, burned it down. But I went back and I, the, the girls and I, or Harrison and I were over there like a year ago and brought home some of the stones from the foundation of that house. And uh, I took Evelyn and Natalie with me over there a couple of weeks ago when we were out hunting um, elderberries and wild plums and stuff. And, and we went down in there and, and uh, I showed them the house and, or the, showed, them, showed them the foundation of the house and stuff. And, and we gathered some more of the stones and, and it's really neat to have some of the foundation stones from the house that my my parents lived in, you know, and now I can take those and I can say, you know, this is the foundation, and we're building upon it. And that's cool. And yeah, so it's it's gonna be really neat. I don't have them stacked up yet, but I'm trying to figure out how and whatnot. But they're all red granite, you know, and and so I think it's that having that marker, there is something special about it, and it is mm-hmm. something important that it's like this is the foundation. This is what I can I can stick my roots down here. And mm-hmm. I know that this is where I come from, and, and so. so. So, and we're actually uh, continuing God's deliverance, uh, the birth of a nation. And so mm-hmm. we're going to get to see a lot of our founding fathers and, and, and different things like that. Uh, but it says in Exodus 1 through 14, records of the liberation of God's chosen people, the Israelites, uh, from oppression of the Egyptians, with God leading them out of subjugation into freedom. It is the record of one miracle after another, a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night, to guide and to protect them. The miraculous opening of the Red Sea, allowing the Israelites to cross dry ground, the supernatural return of the sea to its original state, completely destroying the Egyptians and permanently securing the Israelites as an independent nation, divine protection and sustenance, such as manna from heaven and water from a rock, while crossing the wilderness and before entering the promised land. This entire biblical narrative was a source of inspiration to the Founding Fathers, who saw themselves in similar circumstances of oppression and tyranny from which they pleaded for divine intervention and deliverance. Not surprisingly, they regularly invoked this story throughout their own struggle. For example, following Patrick Henry's famous, give me liberty or give me death speech. Mm -hmm. Um, in, In Virginia, Uh, British troops began seizing public supplies and colonists gunpowder stored in Williamsburg. Henry, unwilling to allow the British uh, action to go unchecked, gathered the local militia and addressed them uh, in an impassioned speech, which which he said this, reminded them of the pillar of the cloud and the pillar of fire, which guided the children of Israel, Exodus 13, 21 and 22, of the water gushing from the rock, uh, at Horeb, of the miraculous passage of the Red Sea, and then with the uplifted, uh, with his eyes uplifted and his arms aloft, and his the whole soul burning with inspiration, declared that the same God still ruled in the heavens, and that He was watching from His throne, the oppressions of His people in America, and that He was still strong to deliver the mighty and to save. But you know. The Founding Fathers, they were just a bunch of deists. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to throw that out there. You know, something that strikes me, talking about, talking about this, and it really is something that bothers me about the American church of today, and that is this. The, the Israelites came out of the land of Egypt. They watched God go... And split the Red Sea. Mm-hmm. And they walked through on dry land. Mm-hmm. They watched this pillar of fire go ahead of them at night and the pillar of smoke by day. And they had seen God's hand of deliverance time and time and time again. And they had talked to the nations as they were coming in and heading towards the promised land. I'm talking about before Joshua and Caleb and the twelve, the ten spies went in. As they're talking to these nations, the nations go, yeah, we've heard about you guys. And we've heard that your God fights for you. And mm-hmm. we heard that your God is on your side. 
and we don't like you, we want you to stay away from us because we're scared of you. Literally is what they were saying. We're terrified of you. And the Israelites, when they sent the 12 spies in, they're like, oh, we're as grasshoppers in their sight. Well, 10 of them, anyway. Yeah, 10 of them did. But two are good. <laughs> the fear. We live in a nation right now where we're walking around in fear of a virus. Of everything. But yeah. Of everything. We're scared of our own shadow in this nation today. And yet we've seen God fight for us on our behalf and yet we're not willing to bend our knees and we're not willing to trust him and we're not willing to do what he says all the Israelites had to do was bend their knees trust God and do what he said mm -hmm. but they could not move past the fear right well and that I mean it's interesting too because even before that as you're talking one of the things of the Red Sea passage Moses starts praying to God mm -hmm. And um, God looks at him and basically says, quit praying, move forward. Mm -hmm. He had to get his feet wet. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, actually, I don't, it wasn't really getting his feet wet, but he had to move forward anyway. Right. And uh, that's, uh, you, you know, that's what, what happened. And it's interesting. I think a lot of times we sit out there and we need to always be praying. Pray without ceasing. Prayer mm -hmm. is absolutely vital and important. I'm not downplaying prayer. But a lot of times I think we pray and we never put actions to it, which when we don't put actions to it, means we're not putting evidences to our prayer, which means we're not praying in faith. Mm -hmm. And the book of James tells us the man who prays, not mm -hmm. in faith. What is he like? Double-minded man. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's funny that you're in James because I'm actually in First Peter here, 3. And this was something that I was listening to this morning and I was talking to my wife about it because it was, it was a really good reminder. And it is First uh, Peter 3, 6. And as Sarah obeyed Abraham... Um, let me back up here uh, to verse 5. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, little l, and you are her children. If you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. You, you, fear other than a fear for God, which is a, a reverential fear. Right. But fear and faith can't coexist. No, they cannot. And, and that's that's something I think people forget about. Um, you, you know, in this, uh, what we've been reading here, it talked about Patrick Henry and his famous "Give me liberty or give me death" speech. Mm -hmm. Do you know the circumstances that led up to that? Um, I've probably yeah. forgotten them. Yeah, I, I don't remember right so, offhand. So he pulls up into a town, and I don't remember the name, uh, what, what town he pulled up into, and he's a, he's a young <clears> lawyer at this point. And he sees a man out in the stocks, mm -hmm. and he goes and he asks, "What's you know?" Ask the town, "What's this man in the stocks for?" Um, what well, was a? It was actually a Baptist preacher uh, who refused to get a preaching license. He says, you, "You can't license me, government, to preach." And I think there were two others also, and I, and I can't remember if it was one of them or all three of them. I believe it was all three of them. These preachers lost their life because they're beaten so badly by the British government uh, because they refused to get a license. And so that's what spurred uh, Patrick Henry to go and to give his speech, give me liberty or give me death. You don't have jurisdiction in the Over ecclesiastical the realm civil government. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an incredible thing. And, and, and I mean, that's literally, you just saw at least one person, I believe it was three, uh, die. And, and, and people who were well respected, I mean, pastors at that time were literally the community leaders mm -hmm. at that time. I mean, church wasn't just church as what we think about it, where you come and you, you, you sing, if I want you, you know, sing a, a praise and worship song, uh, you know, sing of his love forever. And then, um, mm -hmm. are we going to sing of his love forever? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and then uh, hear a 20 minute sermon and uh, about being pumped up and living your best life now and then going home. You know, right. that's, that's not what, what church was there, it, it, it literally was a, 
uh, often a dispersion of, of current events. It was then how to think biblically about these current events. Mm -hmm. uh, it was um, not just to get the news, but I mean, it was, it, it was the heartbeat of the community mm -hmm. as it should be. And here they are killing these, these pastors. Um, and so, I mean, this was an incredibly bold speech that Patrick Henry went and, and I about said preached, but uh, gave. Mm -hmm. It wasn't preaching. It was it, it was speeching. Um, yeah. Public speaking. Uh, do you want me to continue on here? Or yeah. Did you? Okay. Uh, the following year in Massachusetts, Samuel Adams. Now, there's a guy right there. Okay. It's too bad that we know Samuel Adams uh, as, a, as a beer because... Samuel Adams, we should be have Samuel Adams Bible study uh, groups and things like that called because he was he's in charge of Bible societies and things mm -hmm. like that. But I'll, I'll keep going here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it says the following year in Massachusetts, Samuel Adams drew similar parallels between George uh, the Third's tyrannical behavior and that of the Egyptian Pharaoh, observing, "I scruple not to affirm it is as my opinion that this that his king, uh, that his King George the Third's heart, is more." Uh, obdurant or stubborn, and his disposition towards the people of America is more unrelenting and uh, malignant than that of the Pharaoh towards the Israelites of Egypt. But let us not be impatient. It requires time to convince the doubting and inspire the timid. Mm -hmm. um, the very day that Congress approved the Declaration of Independence, July 4th, 1776, it also appointed John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and Ben Franklin to draft a seal to characterize the spirit of a new nation. Franklin's proposal was directly from the Exodus story. Mm -hmm. And Franklin actually, out of the people who probably were deists, Franklin would have been the closest, closest. to a deist, deist outside of uh, Thomas Paine, who's really just a secular, secularist. He was mm -hmm. an Enlightenment thinker. But... Um, he was rejected by our, the rest of the founding fathers anyway, but that's mm -hmm. that's getting in the weeds a little bit, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, his his proposal was directly from the Exodus story. It says, uh, Moses lifting up his wand and dividing the Red Sea, and Pharaoh and his chariots overwhelmed with the waters. This motto, rebellion to tyrants, is obedience to God. Mm. And it's actually got a, a picture of, uh, of this in the, the book. Uh, of the Bible here, the notes, and it has that resistance to tyrants is obedience to God. Isn't that just a wonderful, wonderful statement, though? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You know, our churches here, um, for the most part in America, have been um, complete submission to tyrants, mm -hmm. uh, or you're disobeying God, is what right. they've been saying, which is completely wrong. It's a complete misunderstanding of Romans 13. Mm -hmm. um, but it continues on, it says... The seal, as finally approved by the committee, was Pharaoh is sitting in an open chariot, a crown on his head and a sword in his hand, passing through the divided waters of the Red Sea in pursuit of the Israelites, raised from a f pillar of fire in the cloud, expressive uh, of the divine presence and commands, beaming on Moses, who stands on the shore, extending his hand over the sea, causes it to overwhelm Pharaoh. Hmm. Where are those kind of men today in our legislatures? If we could have a Congress like that, mm -hmm. woo -hoo, mm -hmm. we'd be doing well. Where are those kind of men in our household? Yeah, right. I mean, if, if we would restore fatherhood, if if fathers would take their place, and, and I don't care what culture or whatever group you're with in America, but there are certain groups in America that are more fatherless than others. And if we would restore that fatherhood and move back into it, we would begin to then see, because it always starts in the house. Oh, yeah. It, it always, and this is where we have it so backwards. Families are the backbone of, a, backbone of a society. Right. We have it so backwards because we think that it flows from the top down, but it really doesn't. It really flows from the families up. Mm -hmm. And if we would restore fathers to their rightful place in the household, we would begin to see it flow up and you'd see it go into the state house, you'd see it go into the White House, and you would see it come back into America. Cultures change as families change, mm -hmm. and families change as fathers change. Right. And that's important to understand. Um, just uh, about a month ago, I preached on um, Josiah, 
uh, mm -hmm. and, and King Josiah, you know, God gives him a, a seal of approval that he was the best king mm -hmm. uh, in, in all of Israel or Judah. Uh, even better than David, you know, he was even better than David. What an incredible thing, I, you know. Uh, and one thing that struck me as I went through uh, all these different things that he did was his love for the holiness of God and therefore his hatred of sin. And I mean, he drove out uh, sodomite and uh, in other prostitution that was amongst uh, the, the temple. And he, he, he tore down uh, these totems that were called uh, Asherahs. And he, he uh, pulled down the altars of Baal and he tore down the high places and he did all this kind of stuff. And it was really convicting, of course, to, to look at this passage of scripture, as scripture always is convicting to look at. But uh, one thing that really struck me about this is we need Josiahs, but we don't just need Josiahs in the civil arena. We need Josiahs in the pulpit. We need Josiahs mm -hmm. in the family. We need Josiahs in the workplace. We need Josiahs that are going to go and love the holiness of God mm -hmm. and hate sin. Uh, and we talked about this a lot uh, last episode uh, of how we can't enable sin. But this is one thing that I absolutely love is that uh, Teshua is enabling righteousness. Mm -hmm. It's it's equipping the girls that are being rescued from the worst scenarios I can think of. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, 11-year-old girl rescued the youngest. I, if I remember correctly, she was like blacked out drunk mm -hmm. uh, from this whole thing, of course, and sexual slavery. Not, and not drunk of her own volition, mm -hmm. by, by the way. I mean, we're not talking bad about, about that. That's not, not the point. The point is, is, is this abuse that she went through. Mm -hmm. and she's rescued and now she hears the, gets to hear the gospel and now she gets to, to, to get an education uh, a biblically based education it's biblically based counseling mm -hmm. and she gets to be equipped financially mm -hmm. through this ministry mm -hmm. that buys the whatever skill that she learns and she works in buys mm -hmm. that from her and by the way it doesn't just go to a big conglomerate and, and everything like that she actually gets paid for her work Mm -hmm. actually gets paid for her work so she can save money mm -hmm. and several girls have saved money and went out and bought things that they you know that they they needed or wanted or, mm -hmm. or something like that I mean it's it's incredible it's it's empowering righteousness instead of enabling sin and we've got so much enabling sin in this nation and in this world we need righteousness empowered mm -hmm. yeah so um, we're gonna wrap up there for today but um, Again, please visit teshuatea.com, T-E-S-H-U-A-H-T-E-A.com, or uh, deliverancetea.com. Both uh, URLs go direct to the website um, just to make it a little bit easier because some people can't spell Teshua, so deliverancetea.com. I'm one of those people. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, if I get to typing it too fast, I'll screw it up too. But um, So thank you very much for joining us. Please like and subscribe and share. and. Really, it does help if you can talk to your friends about this, share the podcast with them. Uh, it really means a lot to me. So I appreciate it. And have a blessed day. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Liberty Unveiled podcast, setting captives free one episode at a time. The Liberty Unveiled podcast is a part of the Unresolved Podcast Network and has been brought to you by Teshua Tea Company, T -E -S -H -U -A -H -T -E -A or deliverance t.com